Broadly speaking, there are three main types of credit, revolving, installment, and open credit. Revolving credit is often a line of credit or a credit card that has a capped limit and you can use it up to that limit. There may be a minimum payment requirement, but there's not a fixed repayment schedule, meaning it can be drawn, paid back, and then again redrawn up to its limit. Then there's an installment loan, which does have a predetermined payment schedule. These loans are often given for a specific period of time, for example, a 30-year mortgage or a five-year car loan. For a commercial borrower, these might be a five, six, or seven-year equipment loan, and so on. These types of loans are often called reducing or amortizing, since the principal outstanding reduces with each repayment. And then, finally, there's open credit. This is how a good deal of trade credit is structured in B2B, or business-to-business transactions. With open credit, a vendor extends to its buyer the ability to use its products or services on credit, but that amount is typically due in full at the end of some period. So for trade credit, that means by the end of the payment term, maybe 30, 45, or 60 days from the date an invoice is issued. A non-business example is a utility bill, or maybe a cell phone bill. Individuals use their cell phones as well as utility services, like electricity and water, all month. Then their bill is due at or near the end of that month. This is a very common form of open credit. Loan payments consist of two parts, principal and interest. Principal is the face value of the credit that's being extended and which must be repaid in full at some point. Interest is the additional charge on top of the principal amount that's paid as compensation to the lender for providing the capital. So, for example, if a $1 million credit facility was extended to a business on a five-year amortization, assuming the loan was an equal amortizing loan, then $200,000 in principal would be due each of the five years until the remaining balance was zero. With interest, We're looking at the fee or the expense that's being charged as the cost of making the loan, and this is paid over and above the principal amount. Interest is what compensates the lender for taking on the risk of lending out that money, and it's calculated as a percentage of the outstanding loan principal. Well, there's a lot more to the mechanics of loan pricing, which you can explore in CFI's loan pricing course. As a general rule, the higher the risk of the borrower, or the higher risk the nature of the transaction, the higher the interest rate will be to compensate for that incremental level of risk. Interest is expressed as a percentage of the outstanding loan principal, like 2%, 5%, 10%. Interest rates are also most commonly quoted as an annual rate, even if payments are made monthly or otherwise. There are a few different types of interest. We'll explore each in the next few lessons, but as a rule, interest is either regular or accrued. And it's either simple or it's compounding. To illustrate the different types of interest, let's work with an example million dollar loan on a three year term at 5% interest, with interest charged annually, although there are no principal repayments. Let's assume the entire principal amount is due at the end of year three. If this is a regular interest loan, then a cash payment is made at the end of each period. In this case, that's at the end of year one, year two, and year three. For our example borrower, that means a $50,000 cash payment, 0.5 times 1 million equals 50,000 at the end of each year. That's also an example of simple interest. Simple interest is best explained as interest calculated on the original principal amount of the loan. So expanding upon our example, At the end of year two, this borrower, making regular interest payments, would owe another $50,000 in cash interest expense. Same at the end of year three. Simple interest is additive. The cumulative amount of interest paid after year three of this loan term is $150,000. 50 plus 50 plus 50. Accrued interest is the opposite of regular meaning rather than making a regular cash payment at the end of each year, the interest owing would instead accrue or accumulate and would be due at the end of the term. Accrued interest is often referred to as 
a pay-in-kind structure, or PIC. But with an accrued interest structure, simple interest doesn't make sense. Think about it. The lender wouldn't see a single dollar of interest or principal until the end of year three, in our example. That's where compound interest comes in. Compounding is when interest is charged on top of interest. The formula for calculating compound interest is P times 1 plus I to the power of N minus 1, where P equals the original principal amount, I equals the nominal interest rate, and N equals the number of periods. In our example, this is 1 million times 1 plus decimal 0, 05 to the power of 3, all minus 1, which equals $157,625. You'll note that this is more than in our additive simple interest example, which makes sense since interest is being charged on interest that's being accrued. In our example, that's another way of saying that the loan principal continues to get larger at the end of each period. Since we're only talking about three years, I can actually illustrate this year by year. At the end of year one, the borrower owes 50000 which we add to the million outstanding. At the end of year two, they owe 5% again, but this time 5% of $1,050,000, which is 52500 Add that to the million 50000 and the borrower owes $1,102,500 at the end of year two. At the end of year three, we now multiply this amount by one plus decimal zero five, since the principal is due two, and we get $1,157,625, which, less the million dollars in principal owing, is the same interest figure we calculated earlier using our compound interest formula. As a matter of practicality, accrued interest structures are virtually always charging compound interest. For regular interest payments, they can be either compound or simple interest. There's no hard and fast rule. Loans can have a variety of different characteristics. And what's interesting is that a skilled credit professional, like a commercial banker or an analyst, can actually mix and match different characteristics to customize what we call a loan structure, based on the nature of the credit request and the perceived level of risk of the borrower's business. CFI's CBCA program explores these concepts and more, but for our purposes in this introductory course, we'll take a high-level approach. Broadly speaking, loans can be structured as a fixed rate or as a variable rate, sometimes called floating, as operating credit or as term financing. If a loan is of the term financing variety, it can be either amortizing or non-amortizing, again, often called reducing or non-reducing. And credit can either be secured or it can be unsecured. Let's look at each in turn. Let's compare fixed rate and variable rate loans. With fixed rate loans, the interest rate remains the same over the loan term. With variable rate loans, the interest rates are set relative to a reference rate. The reference rate is often what's known as bank prime, which, as we know, changes over time. It can go up and it can go down, informed largely by macroeconomic factors and central bank policy during a given period. Let's look at an example of a fixed rate loan. The interest rate does not follow the changing rates in the market, as you can see in the chart. And if you look at the table, you'll see that each year as the reference rate changes, the interest rate on this fixed interest rate loan remains at exactly 5%. Now, let's look at an example of a variable rate loan. You can see in the chart that the interest rate on the loan follows the reference rate, and you'll notice that the difference between the two lines is the same over time. By looking at the table, you'll see that the difference between the two lines is called the spread, and that is set in this example at exactly 2%. While we won't cover the specifics in this course, you should know that the spread on a loan is a function of the borrower's level of default risk. You'll see when the underlying reference rate is 5%, the all-in client rate on this loan is 7. 
when the underlying reference rate moves to 5.75, after adding the 2% spread, the all-in client rate on that loan is 7.75%, and so on. So let's look at why a borrower might want either type of loan. With a fixed rate loan, it protects them from rising interest rates in the future. So if the borrower's management team is worried about rising rates, then they may seek out a fixed rate on their credit exposure. It also makes it much easier for the borrower to plan for future payments when building forecast models. On the flip side, it's worse for the borrower if interest rates fall in the future, as management is locked into a specific rate. It also limits flexibility if the borrower wishes to repay the loan early. There are generally steep cash costs to breaking a fixed rate loan, often called breakage costs. With a variable or floating rate loan, there's the ability to capitalize on a reference rate decrease over time, assuming management thinks that this will be the case. In general, variable permits early payouts too, and therefore maximum flexibility for a company's management team. It's worse for the borrower though if the reference rate rises over time. When it comes to operating credit versus term financing, let's think back to the lesson on how and why credit is used. A skilled credit professional will always structure financing according to the nature of the underlying assets being financed. In general, current assets, like our inventory example earlier, as well as accounts receivable, will be financed using a current liability, while trade credit, or accounts payable, count as current liabilities. When it comes to bank financing, we're typically talking about an operating line of credit, sometimes called a revolving line of credit or even just a revolver. It's operating credit because it supports day-to-day -day operations, and it revolves more or less daily, depending on the changing balances of working capital accounts like receivables, inventory, and payables. Many long-term assets are lumped into one category on the balance sheet, called Property Plant and Equipment, or PPE. This category commonly includes equipment and commercial real estate, as well as physical improvements that have been made to any buildings in which these businesses have operations. Other examples of long-term assets include investments in, often subsidiary businesses, as well as goodwill, which is a byproduct of merger and acquisition activity. When credit is used to support these acquisitions, it's typically structured as term financing, meaning that it comes with a predetermined fixed repayment schedule, as opposed to revolving operating credit. The length of the repayment term is largely determined by the useful life of the underlying asset or assets that are being financed, as well as the nature of the credit request. When financing is of the term variety, meaning it's not operating credit, it can be structured as either amortizing or as non-amortizing, again, sometimes referred to as reducing or non-reducing. With amortizing loans, the principal payments are spread out over the life of the loan. As a result, the principal balance decreases over time as principal repayments are made, and it's designed to be fully repaid by the maturity date. Principal payments may be the same each period in what's called an equal amortizing loan, or the principal amount may vary month to month if the loan's what's called an equal payment loan. This is what many personal borrowers are most familiar with. We'll look at an example of each in the coming lessons. In fact, we'll build an amortization schedule for both, so you can really get a sense of how they work. With a non-amortizing loan, the full repayment of principal is made at the end of the loan term with a bullet payment. If it's an accrued interest structure, as we discussed, then the total accrued interest is also due at the end. If it's a regular interest structure, then cash interest payments are still made at predetermined intervals along the way, probably monthly or quarterly. So why might a borrower consider one of these alternatives versus the other? Well, with amortizing loans, the principal reduces along the way, so the borrower doesn't have to pay as much interest over the life of the loan. If you were to add up the total interest paid in a reducing loan versus a non-reducing loan, it would be lower. From the lender's perspective, reducing loans are also less risky, since they receive a small portion of principal each period along the way, 
meaning that repayment risk is lower as the term progresses. Why might a borrower prefer a non-amortizing loan then? Well, even though they pay more interest over the course of the term, the payments that are made along the way will be much smaller because there's no principal, only interest. In fact, there may be no payments at all if it's accrued interest. Non-amortizing loans are generally preferred by fast-growing companies that need to preserve cash in the short term for reinvestment. For example, from a lender's perspective, while repayment risk is higher because all principal is being returned sometime in the future instead of monthly throughout the loan term, the potential return is greater since the total interest paid is higher. Let's open up our Excel file and get into the spreadsheet for some practice. We're going to build two different amortization schedules together. 